<laughs> Look at how she's just checking me out. She's just sniffing around here. This is only the first of a few animals we've seen in this video. Because of the dedication to herpticulture here, the reward is... What's going on hanging out here with Peter Birch? We're in Australia, we're at his home. He's been gracious enough to let me hang out and crash here. And he's been an amazing host. <laughs> but what's really cool is today's topic is keeping animals in captivity and the longevity you can accomplish with this. Our animal mission is simple. Education in action, conservation in action. This is Camp Kennedy. And so who do we got here, man? So this is uh, this is Pippi, my olive python. Beautiful, big girl. The Australian olive pythons, are, I think, are absolutely majestic animals. I mean, I guess compared to the highly patterned large pythons you guys have, it could be considered boring or, you know, just a really plain color, but absolutely No way, I wouldn't animals. agree, man. They're just so beautiful. I love the way that they have this, uh, you know, of course, a lot of snakes have that iridescence. Yeah. Um, but I also love the shape of their heads. Uh, and this is one of Australia's larger pythons, right? Yes, that's right. It, it, it's, it's probably the heaviest python in Australia. Okay. So these guys will attain a, a body mass of around about 20 kilos. Now that's, you know, quite a thick bodied animal. But, you know, here's the reason we're out here. Now, how long have you had this snake? Righto. Now, Pippi here has been with me since 1996. 1996. Come on, man. I was 22 years old. So wait, when you, meaning now when you had her, was she full grown or was she a hatchling? No, no, she was a, a year old hatchling. So, well, basically, she was a year old uh, animal that was considered to be a, a problematic feeder. Okay. Um, therefore, it made the animal a lot easier for me to obtain at the time because they were very scarce in captivity. Back then? Yeah, back then. So, you know, it's quite a few years ago. Um, not many people in Australia were breeding these and breeding them on a regular basis. So, it was quite um, difficult to ob obtain one at that time. My God, man. So, this snake is how old now? I'm not really good with numbers, but I'm going to say she's over 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, 96, 2006, 2016, so uh, 24 years old. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Wild, man. And look at how she's just checking me out. She's just sniffing around here, uh, flicking that tongue out. Uh, beautiful, beautiful snake. I love olive pythons. In fact, I really enjoy all of the Australian pythons. They're really something uh, beautiful, man. But this is just incredible. It's testament to what we talk about, uh, Pete, all the time, is the fact that um, we kind of feel like when you have an animal, it's really great to start out with an animal that is a hatchling yes. and learn the snake That's and right. learn its different life stages. You oh, know? definitely. One of the most important things, I think, is that not only, you know, as a keeper, I, I get a cool animal, but I actually learn what this particular animal prefers and doesn't prefer, and therefore I'm learning consistently. And f from me learning, right. that's awesome as a reptile keeper. I don't, I don't want to just be able to walk in and throw food in a box and it happens. Now Pippi here, um, not only is you know quite an old animal, she actually laid a clutch of eggs this year, so she's still reproductive oh, at this age. That is amazing. And uh, as you can see, she's quite inquisitive. And I mean, I guess you start to get a bit of a scale of the length oh, of it. Oh now. my gosh, yeah, that's incredible, um, mate. And, and these, 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 are, these aren't the longest Australian pythons, you know, by far. But Pippi here is, is just an absolute gorgeous animal. She's in the very early stages of going into shed. And you can just see that slight milkiness in her eyes there. Yep. So she's in those very early stages. And what typically tends to happen is they start to look a little bit, you know, saggy and baggy because they start to look slightly dehydrated. Gotcha. Now, one of the bigger things that I learned by keeping olive pythons is that these guys love lots and lots of water. They need to always have water available. Because okay. they just guzzle the water. Gotcha. It's, it's, it's one of those things. And that's what I've learned from keeping them, not something I've read. Right. You know, and that's the important thing as a keeper for all of us is that we need to be able to look at the animals and understand the animals and therefore and making their life much better. Very cool, man. Well, this is only the first of a few animals we've seen in this video that uh, have been fortunate enough to be in the care of Pete here. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get her put up and we're gonna be right back with another animal. We'll see you in just a second. 
Okay, look at what we got here. Another beautiful Australian species. I actually keep this species at home and it was one of the bucket list animals. Uh, and when I finally got it, Pete, I was super psyched. That's of course the blackhead python, but this gal, it's a gal, correct? Yes, this is a female, yeah. yeah. All right, now, when did you acquire this animal? Okay, so um, I was fortunate enough to acquire some adults in the very early 90s. And this female was one of the first snakes, especially blackheads, that I actually bred and made. So this snake was hatched in 1996. No way, again, another 24 year old animal. Uh, beautiful specimen, uh, you can see just they are a larger python. Yes. But what's cool about these guys is that they are subterranean, man. These guys will go into burrows and that's where they like to do most of their hunting. That's right, and I mean, you, you can see that when you go, they, they feed. I mean, whenever you touch these guys, and this might end up badly, but you can see whenever you slightly touch them, oh, when yeah. anything touches them, they, they, they respond instantly. They know exactly what's going on. And like you said, that's because they're a burrow hunter. Okay. They, they'll go into a burrow, and of course you can imagine how cramped those conditions are, and they touch, if they touch something, they'll just turn around, grab it, and usually push it up against the side of the burrow. And, and wedge the animal there. That's out. right. So it's not really a, a constriction motion, but it's more like a wedge to hold them in place, and then they can work out what's going on. Yeah, that's really cool. Now, these guys also have one heck of a feed response, and oh, that's yeah. also because uh, if they feel something, uh, they're definitely going to want to uh, strike at it. And the other cool thing is you look at the shape of that head, uh, and it is a little bit uh, flattened out so they can kind of get through uh, those burrows. Now, these guys will also dig a little bit as well. They'll use their nose, nose like a bit of a probe. shovel to yeah. probe around and, and poke. Um, and one of the coolest things, I guess, for a python, um, and spe specifically these guys, and the Woma pythons, both Aspidites, is they don't have uh, the typical heat sentry pits on the bottom lips or around the front there. Now what they suspect is underneath the front lip here, underneath that shield, okay. they suspect that there's a, a very primitive form of heat basically heat sensory pit right in there. Get out of here, that's really um, cool. But in all reality, these guys aren't really fussy when it comes to dinner. They'll eat everything and anything. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely want it. Well, her name's Nipper for oh, a reason. There you so go. she likes to have a bit of a nip every now and then. So, you know, sometimes she'll just bump into you. Um, and these guys are really sneaky little buggers, you know. You Look, she's wagging her tail there a little um, bit. A little bit upset, yeah, probably. A little, a little bit excited. Yeah. So it's not unusual that these guys will sort of be sitting in your hands and you'll be nursing them and everything will be fine and then all of a sudden she'll turn around, <laughs> touch you with the mouth and it'll be connected to you. Oh wow. And it just connects to you. It's like a vacuum cleaner. They're, they're right, well, absolutely amazing. Well let's get her put up and yeah. then uh, we're going to come back with a little bit more of an aggro guy <laughs> and uh, we'll see how we go with that. Yeah, we'll see how we go with that one. Alrighty. Oh, there you go. Look at this people. Australia's largest snake species. Scrub Python now. What's his name? <laughs> this guy doesn't have a name, so I'd, I'd be open for names. Oh, well, he's quite the impressive beast here now. How long have you had this snake? This guy's only five years old, so I, I got this guy as a hatchling. Okay. And, um, you know, he, he's... And I typically find the males are a little bit more... Um, they don't really have a great temperament as such. So I wouldn't be surprised if he turns around at any moment and sort of has a bit of a go. Okay. So. We're just going to try and get him to relax a little bit. There we go. Because he had his mouth agape there. Whoop, so shoot, there's that's a okay. While I've got him, he doesn't have that extra length strike zone. But as you can see, beautiful specimen. These guys are supposed to grow to about five and a half meters, and that's most females. Wow. And the males are typically around about four meters. Um, so basically, for all our overseas friends, this snake is close to three meters, so another three feet it should grow. Wow. And that's on average, and then they start to thicken up a bit. Yeah, so, you know, you mentioned you had this animal since it was a hatchling. Has yep. it always had the, the disposition it displays now? Yes, most definitely. And, and I, I really believe it's because it's the sex. It's a male, and the males typically are a little bit more aggressive for some reason. That's so funny, and this is something that you learn from hands-on experience, yep. raising the animal up. So many people... Um, Sometimes they get involved in something or they get an animal that's already an adult and they find out it's way too much to handle right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. and th there's probably a reason why people are selling adults too, you know. Um, maybe the, the keeper themselves aren't putting in the time and effort. There we go, so so, I'm reacting. But you can see, um, see how he's coiled back now. He's 
he can I'll reach me. A little bit closer to you, yeah. And that was just because, you know, I made him nervous, to be That's honest. It. I'm That's waving it. the camera around, so we'll try and be a little bit less, uh, less aggressive towards him. Yeah. He's really not being aggressive towards us. He's being defensive. That's, That's a nice right. defensive position. That's exactly what So I'm going to stay right here, but you can just really see how long this guy is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, that's incredible. I I wanted to just also show an animal, maybe it isn't the quite the age as some of the other snakes, but it's showing you just the commitment that you need to have when you're working with any animal, whether it be one of the larger python species or even some of the smaller ones that you might have. So really incredible. So next we're gonna meet a pair of animals and uh, I'm excited to show people these. These are not actually snakes, they're lizards. I think you guys will like this story. So we're gonna go ahead and get this guy put back up and uh, hopefully Pete doesn't get a few tattoos from this, <laughs> this little guy. Oh, leave some names in the comment for yeah. this scrubby here. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear some great names for this guy. All right, we're losing light, we're getting moving. Here we go. Okay, Pete, what do we got here? Let's see. Let me show you back that empty oh, box. Oh, wow, that's wow. fantastic. Yeah, oh well. That's um, awkward. Mm, um, gee, uh, well, there you go, everybody. Um, he's going to have to find them right out here, I'll bet. Have to dig, yeah. yeah, yeah I'm going to have to get to work, get to work. Like where they're going. There we go. There you go. These two guys. All right. All right, obviously some blue tongue skinks here. And i um, just curious about these guys. These guys, Pete, you've had for a long time. Oh yes, so th this girl here, we actually found as a neonate in an old dump site, and that was in 1993. <laughs> um, and, and this guy here, we found in 1995. Oh my gosh. Um, they were both small animals, like very small animals. And as luck would have it, we initially thought, thought this first one here was a male. Okay. So we named, named it Charlie. Um, as it turned out, Charlie actually had a litter of babies and obviously is a female. So Charlie's a female and then you've got this guy, Bullfed. And I mean, there's some sexual dimorphism yeah, the head's in the a head shape. Bit, yeah. um, the, the tips of their noses are a little bit tarnished. And that's because these guys were living in an outdoor aviary and we had a bit of a rat invasion. Uh oh. Um, so we were lucky enough that's all that really happened and we were able to remove them and place them inside one of these um, little enclosures here. Right, more protected yeah. from any kind of rodent yeah. infestation. Uh, all right, but you mentioned they had babies, but tell yeah, everyone babies. when they had a litter of babies. That's what's really cool. So basically, th these guys had a litter of babies and they've had quite a few litters of babies, but I guess the most impressive thing that we're talking about right now is the fact that these guys only had babies about three weeks ago and she had 15 live babies. So there was no stillborns, there was none of that stuff. After just... about 27 years. Yep. So, and guys, guess what I have right here? I got two other little uh, kind of clutch mates here, I suppose. They're quite feisty. Yeah, very feisty. Uh, I'm trying not to get bit. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, it's not gonna happen, is it? Yeah. You're gonna squirm on out yep, of there? Yep, Make it easier uh, for I'll take Ooh. a bite for you, mate. Yeah, no worries. Eey. Oh, you're getting it there, yeah. are you? Yeah, oh, look at that squirmy little guy there. Oh, no. <laughs> here, let me go ahead and do this. Oh, he's gonna get it. Oh, you're tough. Even at that size, you yeah. can feel the bite pressure. Right, right. So. There's let, mom. Let, let one of them bite you. All right. Let, let this guy bite you because he go ahead. wants to bite. Get Let's me see. going. Come on, go. Go on, mate. Go, go ahead. Give me a go. Oh, it's about to happen. Oh, yeah. So you feel yeah. that bite pressure. Yeah, now definitely. Now imagine it this size. Right. It would definitely So hurt. Th these guys are built for crushing things. Okay. And I mean, th their favorite food is snails. Snails are quite difficult to break at the Makes best sense. of times. And um, they basically have a, a larger tooth in the back of the jaw, which is used for breaking the snail shell. Almost like a molar. Yeah, so basically they, they, they open their mouth, they scoop it up, they roll it to the back of the jaw and they sort of crunch it and then they'll roll it in their mouth with their tongue. And then basically once they can get to that really gooey bit, you know, a little bit of like a, an oyster, yeah. then they'll spit out the shell, which is kind of cool. When you actually see it happen, it's absolutely amazing. That's so cool, but man. They're beautiful animals. I Definitely. Mean, just common Eastern blue tongues, something I guess we find in our backyards around here and don't really think too much about it. I mean, absolutely gorgeous animals. But here's the cool thing, guys. So uh, because of the dedication uh, to herpticulture here and what Pete's been up to, keeping these animals for so long, the reward is they're able to reproduce uh, well into, for this species, I mean, what do they normally consider uh, old age for well, these guys? I've heard of other individuals keeping these animals till about 35. There you go. So very long-lived animals in okay. the grand scheme of things. Right. But I mean, 
a real dedication. Yeah, definitely. And it's you got to be dedicated yeah. and you got to pay attention to your animals. And uh, if you do that, the animals reward you with a long life. And the goal, of course, of any reptile keeper is to get their animals to reproduce uh, so that a new generation can be enjoyed and that we can further their uh, existence on the planet, mate. That's, right. That's it, man. All right, so I want to say thanks to Pete Birch here uh, for more than just showing us his uh, awesome animals and teach us a little bit of, uh, about them. I want to say thanks for letting me crash in the spare room. Uh, go on over to Criticam on YouTube if you guys want to find out more about Aussie animals. Pete's the man to do it for you. He's got a nice channel out there. I'd like you guys to go subscribe. Tell him Camp Cannon sent you. We're going to get these animals put up, and it's time for some Thai. Thai food. Some Thai food, yeah. yeah. Pete yeah. talks Thai. Pete talks Thai. Real good. See you guys. Yeah, it's real good. <laughs>